Thank you, Jess. And uh, thank you, everybody, here for your time today. My, my goal today is to have you guys bring home some both intellectual academic knowledge about levels of marketplaces, which is the marketplace maturity model, and also actionable um, tactical items that you can start working on next week when you get back to the office. So in that, we're going to talk about the marketplace maturity model. Again, the academic, you know, what are the stages of marketplace evolution? And what are the enablement steps or the actions that you can do? Um, but first, let me uh, just send one, one slide on McFadden Digital, just give you some context of who we are and our background for this. Um, four things you wa I want you to know about McFadden. We um, build large scale sites, so sites that are billion dollar plus. In fact, we have four clients now doing over a billion dollars a year online, one approaching 10 billion e a year. Uh, one of our marketplace clients in the past uh, had over 10,000 micro sites, different uh, reseller sites on their, on their marketplace, uh, 10 million dollars per hour. So very large scale sites we've been architecting and, and deploying, as well as some great uh, international brands. 30 years we've been doing this uh, system integration work, but 20 years, the past 20 years have been focused on e-commerce. Uh, cumulatively, our, our clients generate tens of billions of dollars of revenue through e-commerce, and on the marketplace side, billions of dollars from a, over a dozen different marketplaces that we've implemented, uh, almost all with Miracle in the recent few years, as just mentioned. As a company, we have people spread across our U.S. offices, Brazil offices for nearshore development, and India for offshore development, for low-cost development. And uh, probably the thing that we're most proud of is uh, helping our clients succeed and when our clients win awards. Just mentioned the uh, uh, Magento Award that the Albertson site won. Uh, recently, uh, four of our clients in the Oracle platform were nominated for awards. One was a, a marketplace uh, for essentially the uh, American Express uh, membership awards uh, down in, in Brazil. Uh, Lavello, that won an award for uh, um, e-commerce solution, and uh, we were the Miracle Partner of the Year 2018-2019. Uh, so that's it about McFadden. Uh, focus really now is about the education for you. So we're going to organize our session around that marketplace maturity model on the top. That's the what. So what are these different levels, kind of the assessment of different stages of marketplace maturity and how they've evolved over the years and how many users of Miracle evolve uh, from first party e-commerce into the, the top tier optimizing system. So we'll talk about the different levels and we'll give specific examples about each of those. And then that'll be about the first third of the session and the second two thirds of the session is gonna be how. So giving you the tactical steps that you can take to improve your, your maturity from e-commerce of just first party products all the way up to optimizing. And in that, we're gonna break it down into three areas strategy or some of the advisory type uh, decisions that you need to make around the marketplace, the technology implementation. Uh, you also see a technology poster there we'll, we'll walk through, and then the business operations. So this includes business decisions and ongoing business operations like staffing that we'll need to, to talk through. And the way we're gonna turn that into actionable items for you is we're gonna go through three exercises in the workbook. So let's start off with uh, the first topic of what. What is a marketplace maturity model? So what are the five different tiers? So for those of you that uh, are familiar with the IT space with a CMM, Capability Maturity Model, or CMMI, this is really modeled after that approach to maturity within an organization, starting with the first tier being first party um, e-commerce. And we're gonna go into each of these in a little bit more detail, but this is just to give the big context, and you'll see this iconography of the, the color scheme as well. First party e-commerce that's been around for a quarter century. Dropship is a, a minor incremental improvement over that where third parties can fulfill orders, but really not a platform or a marketplace. Third is the actual 3P uh, marketplace, third party marketplace. That's where I think everybody wants to start with at least an MVP of a marketplace. And a lot of you already are, are there. Uh, and then we'll talk about the next two tiers above that. One is quantitative management where you use the metrics that are generated from your system, the knowledge that's gained from a marketplace to optimize your business and automate the business. And then the top tier is optimizing. This really involves how some of the leaders in the market, like um, we'll talk about uh, Amazon and of course Best Buy, you'll hear from later this afternoon, are really innovating, transforming the industry, along with making continuous minor incremental improvements on an on ongoing basis. So the basics, first party e-commerce. It's been around since uh, the introduction of SSL in the mid 90s. Essentially, uh, probably everybody's very familiar with this. The operator sources products, 
negotiates the contracts for those products, merchandises them, meaning maybe uploads images or take, does photography of images of products, uh, puts the description, creates the SEO content, sets the prices. That's an important part of the first party as well. The operator, e-commerce operator is responsible for setting prices, hold the inventory, both financially and physically. So you have to put out the capital to hold the inventory in a distribution center, and you have to um, physically have that space, and fulfillment, of course. So this is, uh, again, been around for a while. These, the elements that I mentioned are some of the core activities that are part of the constraints in scaling uh, in a first-party e-commerce business. Certainly there are you know, e-commerce operators that have scaled to billions of dollars with, with this model, but oftentimes it takes a decade or decades to get to that scale. And we'll see, as we heard earlier today, examples of organizations getting to billions of dollars in just a few years. So an example of this, uh, one of our clients, Louis Vuitton, uh, high-end uh, luxury brand rated uh, by many as the, the leading luxury brand. You know, they want to stay pure to their model, and, and this is fine with their business model. They uh, feel that it would be dilutive to their brand if they had other purses next to their $5,000 purses that they're selling. Not that I buy a lot of those. But, <laughs> but there are reasons for some of these business models. So moving on to level two. And I'm going to go through level one and level two fairly quickly because I think most people are fairly familiar with first-party e-commerce and the dropship models. But uh, the change in this little simplified stick figure is we take some of the uh, responsibility away from the operator and scale that out to the drop shippers uh, who are going to hold inventory, again, financially and physically, the, the capital for holding that inventory, and they're going to work on fulfillment. Sometimes they'll do some customer support, uh, but generally the operator still needs to handle a lot of that merchandising the products. This is just a minor incremental change. Um, the need to negotiate those contracts. Many of our customers, especially in B2B, we see that this process of negotiating a contract with a new vendor and new products can take one or two or more months. Um, and that's not the way to be agile and quickly respond to market demands. It certainly is, is uh, holding back a lot of other elements when, when the uh, operator has to, for example, uh, enter new vendor into the ERP system, enter every new product into their ERP, do the photography perhaps on that product, so again, still limits the scalability, but it does expand the catalog a little bit with some, some actions there. Again, the constraint in scalability is that time to onboard vendors and time to onboard products. So a lot of people say, well, what's the difference between a marketplace and a drop ship? Some of these elements are, are unique in that. So let, let's talk about level, uh, an example of level two. So Granger, a huge B2B distributor, uh, they carry a lot of items or sell a lot of items that are very difficult to stock and to fulfill. So in this example, a thousand gallon uh, fuel tank is not something that's easy that you can ship through the US Postal Service. It needs special delivery. There may be hazmat chemicals, um, other items that have special handling needs that need to be shipped out. This is a perfect example of something that, that, can, uh, that would be a drop ship item for an organization. But let's get to uh, the main reason we're all here to talk about third party uh, platforms, really how you uh, become a platform business. So in this case, you'll notice that what the operator does is a little bit different. It's more around setting global terms and conditions. And the reason these are global is it eases your scalability. It, it does definitely takes some time to invest in creating the, uh, the proper terms and conditions. But once you have those, you scale hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of sellers with those same generalized terms and conditions instead of negotiating new contracts for a month or two with every single vendor that you want to onboard. The process, the responsibilities of the seller now include recruiting of the, sorry, the responsibilities of the operator include recruiting and onboarding sellers, which is far easier than the process of onboarding new dropship vendors or, or new products into your, your first party catalog. Of course, selling, uh, paying those sellers and uh, curating the categories. So managing your catalog, ensuring what you are offering is what you want to, to present to your customers. But the real benefit of this is when you get into that, what the seller has to do. So you're offloading that responsibility of sourcing products, finding what's hot, trending, and the latest uh, product out there, merchandising it, doing photography, images, SEO content, uh, merchandising it, uh, setting the prices. So again, this is where the benefit comes of, of multiple sellers competing against each other. They hold the inventory, again, financially and physically hold the inventory, uh, and they handle fulfillment. Sometimes even third-party sellers handle support. 
So again, just to summarize that, it's really the level at which you become a platform business. And that the benefit, or how that happens, is by outsourcing a lot of these activities. And it provides that ability to scale. Urban Outfitters, one of our, our um, past clients on the e-commerce side, is an example of this. A third-party marketplace enables selling watches and a variety of other products outside of the, the catalog um, that they keep as first-party products. Uh, Anthropology was mentioned earlier this morning, uh, or the, today, and they're a sister company of Urban Outfitters. So where do you go from level three? Uh, the quantitatively managed uh, marketplace is one in which the numbers drive uh, the performance of the business, both uh, looking at the data, getting insights into that, the both uh, prescriptive, predictive and prescriptive um, numbers, as well as automating, using that data to automate uh, what you're doing with the, with the site. So again, the, the operator and the seller activities remain fairly similar, but it's a lot of this data collection using that number, those numbers, um, automating some of the processes. So automating, I'll later give an example of how you can automate some of the seller management, promoting or suspending sellers based on that data that you collect from the, from the, the system. Optimizing your categories, looking at the data of, of, and this is one of the benefits that Amazon has, is just think about all the data that they collect on the hundreds of millions of products that they have from the millions of sellers on Amazon. They get insights into that, and from there they know now, this is a great pro the product that we should move into first party inventory or maybe even private label something because you know, batteries are a category that is selling well and makes a lot of, has a lot of margin. Optimizing commissions, automating the payments. So a lot of things can be automated to get you above that MVP marketplace. And again, just to, to summarize two things here. One, metrics are going to drive the business. Those KPIs, defining and, and following those KPIs. And uh, automating those processes based on the data. Uh, and again, this helps scale the business even further than just initially having the third party platform. So talk about an example here. Uh, John this morning, or earlier today, spoke about the Albertson site. Uh, McFadden was honored to work with John and his team uh, in launching this site. So it's, it's uh, as John mentioned, uh, very much a, a sales site, but also a learning site for a lab laboratory to roll out, as, as he mentioned, the products to those 2,500 stores across the country. And what products are selling? What do people like? What are some ethnic foods or specialty um, spices or certain categories, wine, other areas that, that are highly desired? Um, but it's an easy way to test things and roll that out to you know, the 20 plus banners that uh, Albertsons operates. And then the last tier that we're going to talk about in, in the, the what, the uh, optimizing businesses, optimizing your marketplace. So it's hard to diagram you know, all the different ways in which organizations optimize their business. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second with Amazon. Uh, but some of the sample examples could be adding a third party uh, services marketplace, not just products. So if you sell certain products and they're related uh, uh, services to that, so for example, IKEA, um, who wants to assemble all that furniture? So they bought a company called TaskRabbit, which is essentially a services marketplace. Started off with uh, assembling IKEA furniture, but all kinds of other services are available in that marketplace, products plus services. This could be delivery, installation, maintenance, transportation, experiences. Airbnb is now offering experiences when you book a room or uh, at somebody's home, you can also get cross-sold um, an experience in the destination city. Also, um, you'll see at the top the, the buyers can be uh, across the globe as well. A lot of companies will first launch their uh, third-party marketplace domestically only, and then in a later phase expand to international. Uh, so again, there are two elements in this. One is the continuous incremental improvements, so it can be tighter integrations with systems, um, but it can also be some of these transformative business models um, that, that we heard about. So let's take a look at an example of that um, where, the, where the leading edge innovation occurs. So I think later today we'll hear about Best Buy, who's definitely doing a lot of innovation as an optimizing company, but uh, I'll go through a, a, just a few of what, what space permits on the slide of the ways in which Amazon is innovating and optimizing their business. Amazon and Walmart and others are starting to do fulfillment for the third-party sellers. So FBA is, some say, building a moat around their business where that makes it uh, more difficult for competing marketplaces to, to get into their space. They, uh, as we heard earlier, have started up an advertising business. Now uh, the third largest in the country behind Google and Facebook, but over $10 billion in just a few years of revenue from their advertising model. 
Uh, they have a services marketplace at home. If you need somebody to install a, a fan or a light switch that you buy on Amazon, you can get services on Amazon. They, have the, they really pioneered the Bopil, buy in line, pick up in locker. So in this example, in a Whole Foods store, but they have lockers all across the country. They expanded into different uh, categories. So the $13 billion acquisition of Whole Foods certainly got them into the grocery space, which is uh, driving a lot of other innovation and transformation in that industry. But also Prime Now is shown here, you know, same day delivery or within a few hours to your home, not just uh, one day. Start off as two day, then one day, now Prime Now is same day. They take their products that are rated four star or above and create a physical brick and mortar store to sell uh, items that are four star in the four star store. Uh, Prime Day, of course, everybody's heard about that coming up next week. Now it's two days. They did uh, $4 billion in Prime Day last year. It was about 36 hours last year, now it's 48 hours. They're expected to do $6 billion in this you know, artificially created uh, holiday that they made. Um, cross channel. So on Prime Day, um, you, you'd get a $10 credit for money you spend in your brick and mortar. So cross channel um, promotions from brick and mortar to online. Amazon Business. This grew from $0 to $10 billion in three years. Who wouldn't like to grow a $3, $3 billion business uh, in three years? $10 billion in three years. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Digital, digital downloads, digital goods. They're now one of the leaders in music and movies. So um, they've really dominated, started dominating that space. I mentioned um, uh, private labeling or private branding uh, of, your own, of your own goods that they notice are moving very fast on the Amazon marketplace. Uh, not all their innovations stick or last forever. So um, Dash, Amazon Dash buttons, thanks. <laughs> um, were around for a few years. They just uh, retired those. Uh, but you know, they replaced that with conversational commerce, Amazon Alexa. Uh, again, a pioneer in that, bringing out new technologies there. The autonomous store, so taking uh, some of that retail technology and operating stores in a, a staffless retail is something we're also exploring in, in other areas. Um, so many, many ways in which innovation, optimization, transformation can happen at the level five business. All right, so that was the what, you know, the, more the, again, the academic, what are the different levels? Um, before I get into the, um, the how, I mean the enablement steps, I just want to review first party e-commerce, uh, again, the basic that's been around for a while, drop ship as it's level two, three is the third party marketplace, Four is quantitatively management, using metrics to drive the business and, and integration. And last is optimizing, which is the you know, digital, the transformation, as well as the uh, continuous incremental improvements. So before I move on to the how, any questions about the, the what side of things? And feel free to interject anytime you have questions. No? All right. Um, so now the how, the marketplace enablement steps. As I mentioned, we have uh, three areas that we're going to talk about, strategy or advisory, technology, and the business operations. So uh, within those, we're going to talk about you know, platforms, categories, vendors, et cetera, the technology implementation and data and integrations and under that section. And on the business, some of the ongoing operational activities as well as organizational structure and related aspects to running a business and, and scaling that business to a more mature level. And, in the workbook I mentioned, uh, the, the document with the word uh, workbook on the red on the front of it, we're going to go through exercises on levels three, four, and five, again, to chat about amongst yourselves on your table, and then we'll share some of those experiences as a group. So we'll go through um, levels one and two fairly quickly. Again, that's, most people know a lot of that stuff already, but some of this applies to the other, other tiers, but in the strategy section, and again, this is all in the, on the table there, so you have this. I'm, no need to try to write it all down, and I'm happy to send the uh, presentation to anybody who's interested. Just uh, send me an email or info at mcfadden.com, and I'll send you a copy of the, of the deck. So along the strategy side, there's the platform selection, the roadmap, the budgeting, determining your goals, um, putting in the appropriate governance and steering committees to manage the implementation of commerce and oversight of it as an ongoing business model. Um, of course, on the strategy, you have to do the uh, the journey mapping of your customer targets, the SEO, SEM, um, a lot of different tools that can be used along the marketing strategy to, to implement e-commerce. On the technology side, a lot of different platforms out there um, to choose from. You know, we work with Magento, Shopify, Oracle, uh, SAP, uh, but there are a lot of other platforms out there. Some, some of our clients have custom builds as well. 
Uh, so there's a lot of implementation aspects there, setting up the environments, doing the integrations. Some of the e-commerce projects have over 100 integrations at, at the enterprise scale, so there can be a lot of complex work there to, to get to that scale of optimization. And of course, testing and, and tuning those systems for first party e-commerce. And last but not least, the, the business aspect of operating an e-commerce, uh, first party e-commerce system, user experience. And the reason I mentioned some of these things is that the, um, they also apply to the, to the marketplace at, at higher level tiers. So we're not gonna repeat some of these things, but of course, user experience design, creating the, uh, the proper customer journey, the search and sort order, how you're searchandising essentially these, these types of things, style guides, usability, accessibility uh, for the website, specific logic for B2C, and then B2B tends to be a, a superset of the B2C logic that needs to be implemented. And most of the e-commerce platforms have this, a majority of this capability out of the box. You may get into some more sophisticated things in B2B, for example, CPQ, configure price quote, or uh, more complex punch outs, et cetera. Uh, and then you know, the business should be involved as well in the whole process of that, that rollout from the, the kickoff to the user acceptance testing and, and owning a lot of that um, responsibility for the site since they'll be operating it once it goes live, part of that business user enablement. So uh, that was first party e-commerce. Second party, uh, or sorry, level two, which is dropship, is again, it's a minor incremental change here, so not a whole lot of, of discussion here. But again, that contract negotiation process, uh, which can take months sometime at some organizations, especially bigger legacy organizations, selecting the, the, the um, categories, how you're gonna add those products into your ERP or PIM, product information management system or master data management, whatever system you may have for tracking products. Uh, are you gonna do cross stock? Meaning a, a drop shipper will ship to your fulfillment center. You know, it comes in one door, gets repackaged, goes out another door to customers. Not, not ideal for drop ship, but, but does happen sometimes if you wanna have consolidated packaging for your customers. Um, integrations for, for the 3PLs, third party logistics and calculation for shipping times, costs, restrictions. And some of the, uh, the ongoing business activities is those negotiations and, and calculating that and, and uh, the merchandising aspect still exists there. So the e-commerce operator with dropship still has to merchandise those products, upload the images, set the, the descriptions, which many manufacturers may not have when they provide items to you. So that was the uh, level two. Now we're gonna get into the real meat of what we're here for is how do you enable a third party marketplace? So we're gonna spend a lot of time on this one. Um, again, strategy, technology, and business wise. Uh, so on the strategy, we'll wanna take a look at the, the business case, the ROI, what you're looking to, to do, and what's your setting targets like uh, gross merchandise value? What's your GMV target for this marketplace? A lot of organizations start with a MVP, minimum viable product, or you've heard also a minimum, minimum lovable product <laughs> as an initial launch. Um, to get something up quick so that you can show the concept, you can start onboarding sellers. It's very important when you launch your, have your big launch that you have a, a substantial number of products and sellers on board to attract the appropriate sellers onto your site, unless you have an existing you know, critical mass of, of customers from uh, your first party e-commerce site. Um, defining what are your success criteria? Are you looking at this as a lab to test things that are gonna drive uh, product selection for your brick and mortar and first party e-commerce? Are you looking at it to drive huge uh, financial sales numbers in the, in the marketplace of revenue itself? Uh, how are you gonna handle channel management? We talked about um, distributors um, or manufacturers going direct to consumer or manufacturers going through a marketplace to a consumer versus mar manufacturers going through a wholesaler to a distributor to a retailer to a customer. Taking out some of those steps in the middle, uh, how's that gonna affect your channel and your relationship with some of your suppliers? A lot of these strategy decisions need to be discussed. Um, the organizational design. So you will need to hire some additional people to operate a marketplace that you don't have in a first party uh, business. You can generally scale back some of the people that uh, are uh, used in the first party marketplace, first party e-commerce site as you do more and more um, third party sales and less first party. Uh, so as we've seen, some of you may have seen uh, Jeff Bezos' letter to uh, shareholders. He, charted out over the past 20 years the percentage of first party versus third party sales that they've had and started off at two or three percent and now it's over 50 percent of their products are third party as they've moved away from uh, or 
I'd say, reduce the scale of the number of first party products that they actually sell themselves. Um, so some of those organizational people, organizational um, considerations include uh, marketplace manager, you have um, seller recruiting people, seller onboarding, seller support people, and these, the, the head count will actually vary, of course, with the scale of the number of sellers, the number of uh, products that you onboard. Um, once you get a critical mass and once you start automating some things in, in levels four and level five, that uh, dependency on human labor to onboard sellers can reduce. But initially, you'll definitely have some headcount uh, required for this, and there's, that needs to be part of your plan in starting out a marketplace. So again, there's also an offering strategy. That's one of the exercises we're going to go through. What categories make the most sense for you to expand into? Oops. Um, what's, uh, what's your curation process going to be? How open and flexible are you going to be to third parties adding products to your site? Or are you going to be very, very strict about you know, reviewing every, every, product, every product description? Um, or do you want to, somewhere in the middle, in the next two years, you know, automate some of that process and filtering um, the curation of, of tools coming on board, of products coming on board? Do you allow refurbished items to be sold on your site? A lot of these strategic decisions need to be made um, when starting a, a, a project. And then the financial aspect of uh, what's your commission structure going to be? What are the different categories um, that you're going to charge? You can easily, if you just Google... Um, uh, Amazon uh, seller fees or seller commissions, you can see the commission grid that Amazon charges for different categories. Um, in, and some are higher margin, some are lower margin. And then, of course, the, the tool selection. So there are two core elements you have to look into, and we'll talk about that in the technology section. So much like the e-commerce, we still have to do the environment setup. Um, in, in the technology we'll talk about, you still have an e-commerce front end, and you have a marketplace system. So that's where Miracle comes in as really driving the marketplace. But Miracle is almost always tied to an e-commerce um, storefront or customer-facing site. So in here, there are going to be some user experience, user interface changes. So for example, your PDP, your product detail page, um, how you list it on third-party products that you are the only seller of will vary as you may have multiple sellers of the same product. You may have different varying shipment costs from different sellers. You may have different inventory levels from different sellers. There may be different shipment times. You may have multiple sellers listed, um, different terms and conditions for that. Um, sellers have different ratings. Do you show four-star, five-star ratings for the sellers? So that's one, one of the pages, the listing page, PLP, product listing page, the checkout flow, the cart. A lot of different sections of the existing site need to be changed, as well as you'll create some new pages like a uh, seller um, page. So if you want to see the story about this seller, what the rating is, um, if they have an interesting story, in the example of Albertsons, there's some you know, organic and natural-based um, uh, sellers that have a great story that helps attract traffic to their site. Uh, in the middle there, we can see the integration. So taxonomy is probably the most important first thing to work on on a marketplace implementation. Taxonomy is the data structure for your categories and your products and how that data is going to be shared back and forth between Miracle and your e-commerce front end. So getting that right upfront is very important because undoing it or redoing it later is, is very difficult. Uh, and, and as unsexy as data is, it, it tends to drive a lot of the business at the upper levels. Um, it's very important to get that, get that data structure correct and, and set up appropriately. And a lot of other um, elements in here, like the tax calculation is an important one. The, the two integrations that are critical for a marketplace are the payment and the tax, especially with the evolving tax laws. Uh, so we need to do some configuration in there in addition to the integration. So configuring uh, shipping zones, prices, um, categories, um, logistics classes, how, how are you going to track things. There's a lot of different configuration elements, which are fairly easy to do, not too technical, but still a part of the technology implementation. And then for your first MVP, you, know, you generally need to do a lot of hand-holding for the initial sellers that are coming on board. Um, we do generally recommend having a... Uh, um, one or two major um, sellers that have large catalogs that can add thousands or tens of thousands of, catalog of items to your marketplace. Uh, because starting with just the small sellers who have dozens or hundreds of products, it gets, it's onerous to try to build up a meaningful catalog that's going to attract sufficient buyers to your site. So, and uh, last on the business side, we'll talk about some of the, the, the user experience changes that we, we talked about, the customer flow, how you're going to rank. Um, Search results, so do you rank 
first-party products before third-party? Do you rank them by um, cost of the item? Do you rank them by cost plus shipping plus tax? or by shipping time, or by inventory level, or by seller rating, or some combination of all those metrics that you create a formula that, that weighs a number of different factors in there. Um, on the, the business side also, we have to look at those terms and conditions I mentioned. These are important because it's part of the scalability when you can add hundreds, thousands of sellers with the same terms and conditions instead of negotiating individual contracts with each vendor or supplier. Getting that right initially uh, and that's going to be attractive to sellers to come onto your marketplace is really an important business process to define those T's and C's. Um, and a lot of, lot of uh, aspects of that that are more legal or financial, the uh, merchant of record and um, MOR, KYC, which is know your customer. Um, some of these laws to ensure you're not uh, funneling money to um, fraudulent or terrorist uh, organizations. Um, there's a lot of liabilities in there that you wouldn't really think about with a first party e-commerce site coming in there. Um, and that comes into play with the uh, payment provider as well. Um, some payment providers are not very friendly to marketplaces where it's a third party that's the merchant of record um, because of that same liability of KYC, know your customer. So a lot of these aspects need to be decided in, in the process of, of selecting a payment provider and a tax provider. So I move forward here. On the um, technology aspect, you'll see uh, Another wallet size uh, uh, poster there, which uh, we're not going to go through it in detail now, but um, this uh, diagram up here, um, we have in the upper left corner, it's uh, folded there. In the upper left, I have a simplified version of this we're going to go through in the next slide, but you have customers in one corner, vendors in the bottom left corner, and the marketplace operator in the far right corner. And this gives you a day in the life detail about you know, all the things that happen in a miracle plus e commerce system. But let's go to the simplified version of that to look at what happens here. So again, customers in the upper left corner, vendors in the bottom, bottom of this diagram, and you as the marketplace operator, you are a platform. So this platform enables transactions from buyers, sorry, buyers to sellers. It can be, some cases it's a, a three tier, four tier marketplace. Uh, Instacart is an example of a four party marketplace. They have the grocers who are providing the goods, they have the brands who are subsidizing uh, some of their advertising and providing coupons. They have the personal shoppers who go into the store, pick the goods, deliver the goods to your home or deliver to your curbside. And they have the uh, customers who are buying it. So this is an example of a two-party marketplace, but you can have three-party, four-party, multi-party marketplaces, which get, get more, more sophisticated. I mentioned you have the e-commerce system in there. Again, that can be Magento, Shopify, SAP, Oracle, um, uh, Salesforce, Commerce, uh, Commerce Cloud, or, or Cloud Craze. Um, so you have a customer-facing e-commerce platform. Many organizations already have one from their first-party e-commerce. Some uh, of you that are forming new uh, marketplaces will be implementing the commerce front end with Miracle at the same time. So again, Miracle really faces the, the vendors, and there are three ways in which you can get the vendors or the sellers to load their catalog in. One is through a GUI, a graphical user interface, where they may just have their catalog in an Excel file that they export to CSV, or they even upload one, one or two products at a time, which is not, not very fast. But for those small mom and pop sellers, um, that may be the way that they operate. The uh, middle uh, mode there, API, is for generally the more sophisticated sellers that probably are selling on other marketplaces. They uh, can integrate and upload the catalog, as well as have APIs for order um, updates. So, Here's an order they received, here's the order status, here's the shipping information, here's the tracking, here's a, um, the customer request that came back through that API. And then the third channel for integrating interfacing with the sellers is through a van, a, a vendor aggregation network. So like a channel advisor, SPS Commerce, uh, Products Up, uh, there are a number of these organizations that, that are intermediaries and help organize the data from multiple sellers and get that into a format that's easily can be ingested into a marketplace very quickly and easily. It's an easy way to scale up a lot of vendors and products into your site. The negative is there's yet another commission or, or uh, success fee or referral fee that they have to pay in that, that model as well. So, and on the far right, you'll see the marketplace operators. That's you guys. So you are interfacing both into Miracle and into the e-commerce platform. Almost all, all e-commerce platforms generally have a uh, 
uh, admin console through which you can manage the, the, the front end experience, some of the pricing, the merchandising, et cetera. And you also interface to the Miracle Operator Portal. And from there, you can see a lot of the, uh, the data, manage the vendors, manage the catalog, curation, uh, and get access to a lot of the other elements of the Miracle architecture. So that's kind of the, the big picture of technology uh, of things. Now we're going to actually jump into the exercises. So uh, we'll look at the, uh, the document labeled workbook. If you pull that out and look on the first page inside, it's going to be the blue marketplace. And there should be a Miracle or McFadden folks at every table to help facilitate this conversation. What, uh, <laughs> what our intent here is to uh, not have you fill out every question here and turn it in as a homework assignment that's graded. <laughs> the, uh, these are really um, ideas or conversation starters to help you think about some of these aspects. The first topic we're going to talk about is category expansion. So there's some questions here to, to, and all these exercises are organized where we're going to start off with your current situation. And then the second section is kind of opportunities or where you could work with this. And at the bottom of every page, there are going to be tips about how you can help answer some of those questions. So think about what are some of your current core categories and or which ones are growing um, in sales and growing in uh, you know, high margin categories, um, areas you may want to increase. Or what's actually a shrinking sale for you, and you have low margin, you may not want to carry that anymore. These are some, some ideas to think about your current catalog. Um, and from those opportunities, you may figure out which ones you want to outsource to a third party seller. If it's a slow moving product or category, or it's seasonal, um, that's probably a good candidate to outsource to, from your existing catalog, that's a probably a good candidate to outsource to a third party seller. But there's not just uh, optimization within your existing categories, catalog, there's the opportunity to expand it. So there are other areas, you know, what are some adjacent categories? What are some upsell brands from what you carry that's maybe a higher dollar value that you could sell, but you don't want to stock that inventory or, or you don't have a relationship with that brand or manufacturer? Uh, so fast moving categories, low turn, challenging shipping areas, and there are a number of tips at the bottom of the page. So I want to give you guys uh, two minutes at each table to, to talk through this if you want to maybe pair up. With, with, with two people and, and chat through this, each other. And then after two minutes, we'll uh, get some suggestions from the table of some innovative ideas that people may have found on, on different categories. Uh, let's move on to the next exercise. So on, on the next page is seller recruitment. The first, first page we're looking at what categories now, who's gonna sell those to your customers? So um, some, some of the uh, ways of thinking about this are who are your current suppliers or wholesalers that you purchase from or the brands if you're a distributor that you, you purchase from? Um, uh, what are some um, specific products, for example, that uh, other sellers that you may perhaps have a drop ship arrangement with or that you see on other marketplaces doing well? Or what are some of the, the items that some of the sellers that you'll see on Amazon? So uh, here you'll, list, you'll see in the tip some of the uh, bigger marketplaces. You can search for certain products and see who are the sellers on those marketplaces. Um, or even going, working through some of the uh, vendor aggregation networks to, to get um, information there. Searching for a product on, on Google or Bing and seeing who pops up there. So let's think about your current, um, current suppliers and who are amongst your table. To figure out who could be some other sellers that you could onboard to sell to your customers or other customers that you could bring onto your marketplace. So talk amongst yourself for about two minutes and we'll, we'll get back together and hear everybody's feedback. So let's move on to, uh, we have levels four and level five that we're going to go through the, the steps, or I'll talk about, and then we have some exercises. We're going to have to probably pick up the pace a little bit here to get to these last ones, but definitely wanted to talk about them. Um, the data, so quantitatively managed. So a lot of companies don't have a shortage of data. It's really getting from that data into insights and automating things with that. So you can have huge pools of data. You get even more um, data when you have a marketplace but making sure that you're leveraging that to the proper effect. You know, first, the, the data's there, but actually getting insights, meaning what does this do, or um, getting predictions from that. So if I do A, then X is gonna happen. If I do B, then Z is gonna happen. If I do C, then Z is gonna happen, for example. Getting that um, predictability to the next level of prescriptive. So well, what you really should do is C, not A or B. That's the per prescriptive side of things from the data. And then ideally, that data feeds into the system, which, is, which automates it. And we'll talk a little bit about how Miracle can help you automate a lot of those processes 
in, in, uh, in your marketplace. So a lot of different analytics in, in the exercise we'll go into. We list, um, I don't know, several dozen different analytics and metrics that you can track. Um, generally, the, the biggest thing on marketplaces is the number of buyers, number of sellers. And with the number of sellers comes the number of, of products. It's, um, as I mentioned earlier, you probably want to start with some sellers that are going to give you a lot of products to get a meaningful uh, critical mass to your, to your marketplace catalog. But then, of course, GMV, uh, gross merchandise value, is the, the, the key metric that a lot of folks track. Um, but below that, there are a lot of different things in terms of seller incidents and fraud monitoring, card abandonment, some of which apply to first-party e-commerce. But there's a whole new set of analytics that we're going to talk about in the exercise here about uh, metrics for uh, marketplace. On the technology side, um, there's some simple tools from Excel to the screens inside of Miracle from which you can see the data. But a lot of uh, bigger en entities have an analytics or BI tool, data warehouse, that they'll, will help feed this data in, the ETL extract transform load data from the, the transactional system into your analytics system, uh, doing your metrics. And a lot of retailers already have you know, some of the, the very powerful tools for this. Um, there's also within Miracle a lot of automated seller management. On the next screen, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, so some examples of that, how you can manage those um, sellers based on automated data collection, data, data management. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the numbers from the accounting system, making sure that you're feeding that data into your ERP or accounting system, making sure you're feeding that data out to your sellers, you're leveraging it appropriately for reconciling the changing, constantly changing tax laws. Uh, a lot of that, um, many people start off with a manual process of vendor payment and tax reconciliation, but that's not scalable. So really getting a, a proper tax reporting system, tax automated payments in there, helps scale the business from a technology viewpoint. So again, we'll, we'll talk about in the exercise some of these different analytics that you can use but, uh, and, and what, those, what those mean. But some of those can drive, we've talked about 1P to 3P conversions. This is slow moving, it's seasonal, it's expensive to carry. Let's let third-party sellers handle that. Or this is a highly profitable you know, emerging trend that we weren't aware of, but our sellers brought it to us, and we've noticed for the past month or two that it's a great area. Maybe we should get into that space. That's a 3P to 1P conversion. Or is there something we want to private label, like Amazon Basics you know, batteries? If that's an easy commodity to private label, look at the data. Does that make sense to do so? And of course, using that data to optimize your user experience, the customer journey, the, the product detail pages. You probably all know that Amazon's been continuously A-B testing or multivariate testing their customer experience for decades, and that's how they've fine-tuned it. And the same thing happens for any marketplace that you could build. Use, those, use that data to drive the, um, the user experience. So uh, for about 20 years, we've been using this very simple equation for e-commerce, and it applies to marketplaces as well. So revenue is three factors. It's your traffic, it's your conversion, and your order value. So how many visitors come to your site? how many people convert from a browser to a buyer, and what's your average order value, AOV, or your lifetime value for each customer. So again, not exact science here, but, but generally those are the concepts. You want to increase your traffic, increase your conversion, increase your AOV. So ROI is really those three things, your revenue or your return, divided by your investment. So capital expenses up front and operating expenses. Again, this is not scientific here. It's math's not exactly here, but, but it shows the concept you want to uh, follow. So looking at this, there are different metrics to track and actions you can take in each of those categories. So if you want to drive more traffic, get greater product SEO. How do you get greater product SEO? Have more sellers load more products that are optimized and finely tuned merchandised text descriptions that are going to appear better on, on uh, Google, Bing, or, or other search sites. Um, increase your product footprint. If you have a broader category selection or you are the destination for a certain lifestyle, that's how you people start coming to your site. You drive more traffic that way. Um, a lot of different tools that can be used in the traffic side. On the conversion side, so how do you get convert more browsers to buyers? You don't want to be that site where somebody searches for something, it, they get null search results, and they go to Amazon and buy it. That's not the customer journey you want. So having that broader product assortment by a large number of sellers, a large number of products available, um, helps drive that. Optimizing your site search. Um, if it's, again, some of those criteria we mentioned, is it seller price, seller inventory? Um, do you have... Um, can you reduce your stock outs? So if there's a first party product that you sell um, and you're out of stock, should the customer just go to Amazon and buy it? Or would you rather have one of your sellers um, fulfill that order and you take your 15% commission or, or whatever your structure is 
on that sale. So make sure that you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want any sellers selling the same products I sell. But in this example of reduced stockouts, you still get that 15% or whatever the commission is on that, that deal. You don't lose the customer to Amazon or another uh, marketplace. Um, so that improves your conversion on that experience. And AOV, uh, or lifetime value. So cross-sell and upsell. There certainly are, could be a lot of other products that um, sellers can add on to your, that are related products to your um, first party products. Um, or there may be more expensive versions of products that uh, you're selling that you could convince a customer to buy from a third party seller. And would you rather take 10, 15% of somebody else selling a more expensive item or getting what most retailers get, you know, just a couple percent points on first party inventory of a lower cost item. Um, merchandising, we mentioned. Um, so a lot of different areas that you can, uh, tools you can do, um, use, and techniques to leverage to increase your AOV. And then on the, the front side, there are a lot of um, ways to reduce the capital expense. You're using a uh, cloud platform like Miracle. Uh, I mentioned we've been building marketplaces for about 12 years. Um, most of those custom ones were in the $5 million to $10 million to, to build. Um, they took two years in general to build those marketplaces. Now with Miracle, it's much faster. It's you know four to six months for an MVP, and it's a six-figure, not a seven-figure investment in most cases. Um, so reduce the capital cost with a great cloud platform of that, with a lot of best practices for marketplaces built in, instead of you know, paying somebody like us to, to build it custom from scratch for you. Um, scalable solution there. And then that's the capital up front, but on ongoing operating expense, um, again, there's that, that financial carrying cost of inventory, um, outsourcing a lot of that effort. Right now, you know, to scale a first party um, e-commerce site, you need the, generally the number of, um, the size of your catalog is linearly proportional to the number of people that you have to hire and pay salary to. Versus in a marketplace, get more sellers, they do all the merchandising, they upload the images, the pricing, the, the descriptions, Outsource that, um, take your commission, um, don't have that carrying cost of the inventory, automate your processes, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, reducing fraud detection, improving fraud detection and prevention. So a lot of tools to, to reduce your operating expenses. So again, very simple formula here, increase traffic, conversion, AOV, reduce capital expense and operating expense. Very simple, simplified, but um, so not the exact equation, don't put that into your calculator, but it shows the concepts and what you wanna focus on. So here's an example of some of the automation. So we talked about seller automation. Here's the um, kind of the stick you can hit with, hit the sellers with. So if their rating drops below a certain level, um, suspend them below three and a half stars. If their incident rate goes above 9%, um, if their acceptance time is more than 48 hours, uh, or their acceptance rate is below 97% of orders submitted, uh, if, they're, if they cancel more than three orders in a row, suspend them. Um, this last one's unchecked and, and typically, you know, if a seller starts selling too much of a product, do you want to suspend them? This one's not, not in this case. So that's the stick you can hit the uh, sellers with. But there's also the carrot you can offer them of uh, enabling a seller to become a premium seller. And that premium seller status may reduce um, the commission by 1%. Or it may win them the buy box or they get a... Uh, you know, like Amazon recommended product uh, listing by their listing uh, when the search results. So the carrot can be, you know, essentially the opposite of a lot of those same things, but even a number of sales. If a seller has sold more than X units of products, uh, rate them as a premium seller. And all, again, all this can be automated. It's out of the box with Miracle. So this um, process of both Measuring the metrics and automating based on those metrics really helps um, get your marketplace to level four. So now we're gonna do an exercise on level four. Actually, you know what? I think we're, we're probably gonna um, leave this for you to, to do at home um, <laughs> and bring in a class tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll probably just uh, talk through these, just looking at the time. Um, <laughs> and uh, make sure you submit your homework online. <laughs> and then the second exercise is about automation. So again, tips at the bottom, look at your current situation and some of the things that you can do. Uh, so I'm gonna move forward to um, skip these two exercises on level four and go on to um, the marketplace enablement steps, the final, final tier here. So there's operator strategy. So what can you do to you know, transform your business? So again, there are two things we're gonna talk about here really minor incremental improvements, oftentimes through integrations, 
and major drastic transformations um, of your industry, your business. So here's a list of a few um, disruptive business transformation ideas. Um, we talked about adding a services marketplace, uh, and, and Amazon's done a majority of these things. Start opening physical stores if you're a digitally native brand. Um, enable, if you have stores, enable third-party marketplace selling um, through clienteling, like uh, iPads or tablets that the store associates can enable uh, customers to purchase through those, those um, tablets. Um, integrate the point of sale system to order, um, order third-party products. If you're B2C like Amazon was, open a B2B marketplace and grow to 10 billion in three years, or vice versa. If you're B2B, a distributor or manufacturer, start selling direct to consumer. Um, quoting, CPQ, configure price quote, capabilities, a uh, whole list of different things there. Accepting returns, that's an interesting one. Many of you probably have heard that Kohl's started accepting Amazon uh, returns at their stores. And that's been actually so successful for them that they're rolling it out to every single Kohl's store to accept Amazon returns. You think, why would they do that? That's probably their biggest competitor. But they found that through their pilot, it started driving so much traffic to their store, even a third, another marketplace, not even the Kohl's marketplace, that they wanted to expand it and grow that practice of accepting returns in store. Uh, digital goods, loyalty program. I mentioned that, that uh, American Express membership rewards program. It was entirely points-based, and you could redeem points for a million hard goods or services like flights or cars. Um, so loyalty program uh, to be redeemed on marketplaces. This is a laundry list of some technology integrations. I'm not going to, just based on time, I'm not going to go through them, but certainly happy to talk about any of these things. And a lot of it's on the architecture diagram there that you can improve your, your processes with enhanced integrations into different uh, areas. Um, including omni-channel store rollouts and customer care. Uh, and then some of the business, you know, uh, as you scale, um, there's an opportunity as well to outsource some of the, uh, the marketplace uh, uh, activities and a BPO role is something we offer as well for you know, startups of uh, new marketplaces or, or scaling businesses. And then the uh, last box on here is not so much strategy for you, but strategies for your sellers. So how can they uh, optimize their sales of their to win the buy box on your marketplace, uh, helping them get listing optimization and category mapping and, and do some price elasticity t tuning if they're responsible for pricing their products. So there are lots of companies that do this, and a whole ecosystem of companies have grown to enable sellers on Amazon and Walmart and other marketplaces. Um, but this service that can be offered for your sellers on your marketplace. Um, so just a couple more slides here and we'll be done. Um, about 20 years ago, uh, Jeff Bezos sketched out this uh, marketplace flywheel you heard about this morning, the uh, virtuous cycle of marketplaces. Essentially, you get more sellers, you have a bigger selection, better customer experience, drives more traffic, that circle keeps repeating. And in addition to that, you have the lower cost structure and lower prices that um, continues driving more customer acquisition. So that's a, a mock-up of Jeff's uh, sketch. We have um, a little bit more confusing one <laughs> uh, on the back of... Uh, back of the marketplace enablement structure <laughs> that uh, you're welcome to read uh, at your leisure while you're doing your homework tonight. <laughs> um, the services marketplace, I think we'll probably hear a little bit more about that this afternoon, so I'll let Miracle talk about that. And then we have two exercises that, again, part of your, your, your take-home test. Um, integrations, where you can do tighter integrations, and then, some, again, some systems listed at the bottom of that page. And the, the really interesting one is how you can disrupt your industry, like transform it, um, in this document, there are a bunch of examples as well about transformational business ideas. Um, but again, we'll leave that uh, for you guys to do later. Just again, a summary of what we did. We talked about the what, the marketplace maturity levels, one through five, and with a few examples. We talked about strategy, the how to, which is the enablement steps. So strategy, technology, and business. And then we did exercises. Well, we looked at exercises <laughs> around levels three, four, and five. Um, so just wrapping up here, um, we have uh, happy to send uh, digital copies of the, the workbook, the, the uh, document. Uh, we have the posters there. Um, we uh, wrote a lot of, provided a lot of content. Uh, wrote a book on e-commerce best practices about 15 years ago, so that's a little bit dated. But we have vertical industry solutions. So for grocery, uh, blog with things like the uh, marketplace um, uh, tax laws, um, ecosystem posters around the different vendors that you need to integrate into your system. Uh, the Miracle integration poster there, the maturity model. I've got lots of other content, so if you need anything else, um, happy to provide that content. 
So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you.